So uh, very much uh, welcome for our uh, short interview with uh, Valentin Apostolo. He's a, a senior surgeon at the OVLG in Amsterdam. They do approximately 3,000 cataracts per year. And uh, Valentin uh, does, in very many cases, very difficult cataracts uh, with small eyes, heart, very hard, nucleus, and many others. But besides cataract, is also specialist in glaucoma uh, operations, surgeries. But this is now in, within that interview, not the focus, is the focus how to work with our machine and doing a cataract. So, Valentin, uh, what surgery are we going to see? We are going to see a routine cataract surgery. Uh, I prefer corneal incisions and I prefer uh, to place the main incision temporarily because it has less influence on the astigmatism and it also gives a more stable wound. Uh, I like to uh, make two side ports because I'm using uh, the bimanual IA. Of uh, dispersive OVD on the cornea, filling the anterior chamber with OVD. In my case, I do that with dispersive OVD because I'm mostly uh, doing the capsulorexis through the side port. So there is no egress, no leakage of OVD. The anterior chamber stays full all the time. And that's performing the capsulorexis with the needle. Of course, if uh, uh, the eye is challenging, some difficulties with small pupil or a very shallow anterior chamber or uh, something, then uh, uh, then I uh, use also uh, capsulorexis forceps, but mostly it's the needle. I've learned that uh, to do the capsulorexis like that, and I like doing it that way. Here I have another question to you. Have you ever used our capsulotomy tip? to do the capsulorexis? Yes, certainly. I have uh, a couple of those and I enjoy using them in uh, difficult cases. It's mostly when, uh, when it's intumescent cataract and I want to avoid running out of the capsulorexis or uh, if the anterior capsule is fibrosed, like in uh, hypermature cataracts and also in some well, other operations like lens uh, IO exchange, it, it, it's uh, very useful because one can make the opening of the capsule in any desired form, in any desired location. It gives a stable, quite strong edge of the capsulorexis. That's uh, certainly I, uh, something I enjoy using. Okay, in this case, uh, I felt the nucleus with the cystotome. There, it was a moderately hard nucleus, so I decided to do pre chopping. Uh, in this case, the pre chopping is done uh, with the cystotome and the chopper. Uh, as you can see, I omitted uh, the, uh, the hydro dissection, and it's quite very, it's uh, good it, it's possible to be done like that because when displacing the fragments like now then you actually get also uh, cleavage between uh, the nucleus and uh, the uh, cortex and the capsular bag as well okay and now you're working with a 2.230 uh, great angle at uh, FACO easy tip. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That's a 2.2 FACO tip. So the construction of this tip uh, is quite unique and it has several uh, excellent properties. Uh, the opening of the FACO tip is quite large, so it has no problems uh, when uh, engaging a hard nucleus. Uh, it 
gets the nuclear material into the tip and then the, all the emulsification goes on within the tip. Uh, like uh, shown on this video. It also has uh, quite a narrow shaft. The bore of the shaft is quite small, which helps to prevent uh, post-occlusion surges. Well, let's... Uh, okay, I just want to add, I think your settings here you work with a rather high vacuum, probably on the maximum, I think 650, and the flow is probably by 38, 36. Is that correct? That's correct. That's the highest uh, vacuum setting, uh, 650, and the flow by heart is it uh, 35 <laughs> or 40 millimeters. Okay, and the FACO power, uh, I remember that you very often use the burst mode. Is that correct? Yes, I uh, well, I actually always use the, use the burst mode. I like to give the vacuum the time to rise, and only when the vacuum is at its highest, then I engage the ultrasound. So in this way. Uh, it's a very efficient emulsification, but it spares quite a lot of uh, ultrasonic energy. Okay, let's continue. Uh, so, well, uh, one can see here that the anterior chamber remains completely stable uh, when uh, every following quadrant of the nucleus is being removed. So that has to do uh, with the pump and it has to do with the narrow shaft of the uh, FACO needle. And the pump you're using is usually speed mode, is that correct? Yes, that's the, that's the speed mode indeed. So removing uh, the last uh, pieces of nucleus. One has to be very careful with the last bits because there is nothing uh, between the phaco tip and the posterior capsule. And here the nucleus has been removed. Uh, next is the irrigation aspiration. Uh, I like to do that uh, by manually. It uh, gives me a stable deep anterior chamber, and I can also use the irrigation tip not only to irrigate, but also to hold uh, the capsular bag open by pointing, for example, the uh, openings uh, in the desired direction, like uh, downwards or in the direction of the piece being removed at the moment. Well, now the cortex has been removed and I'm switching to the polishing mode with the opening of the, of the irrigation tip uh, pointing towards the capsule with a very low vacuum, something like eight or 10 millimeters of mercury. I like to uh, polish all the well, central part at least of the posterior capsule. Uh, I have I have one question here. Uh, very often I see that surgeon do not polish the capsule, and you are doing it probably on a very perfect way. So can you give me the arguments why it is so important to do this capsule polishing? Well, it's important because it delays uh, the formation of posterior capsule op opacification. Uh, if there are some cells left uh, in the central part of the capsule, they start growing and then uh, uh, after cataract may uh, form even within one year. When removing the cells from the posterior capsule, the central part of it stays clear for well, a number of years. 
I see that it is definitely a good argument, but why are the, or are quite a number of surgeons, why are they so hesitate to, uh, to do the capsule polishing? Are they afraid? Uh, well, uh, it may be a risky, uh, a risky manipulation if uh, the opening of the aspiration tip is not perfectly smooth. Even with low aspiration, uh, if there is something uh, on the edge, some irregularity, uh, one can uh, create a capsule break uh, by just touching it, even with a very, very low aspiration. Uh, the, well, the safe, a safe option is using the silicone tipped uh, coaxial irrigation aspiration because it's almost impossible to make a capsular uh, rent with it. And it also adheres nicely to the capsule. It, uh, the, the lens cells, they, uh, in a kind of a way, they tend to get stuck to the silicone material. So that's also a good option. And uh, in less experienced hands, it may be the safer option. But uh, with uh, these irrigation aspiration tips, I never ever had a posterior capsule break. So I feel completely uh, confident in uh, polishing the posterior capsule. Okay, thank you very much, Valentin. That is, of course, also a big compliment to us. And I tell you, yes, we know we are very proud of our fine manual instruments. Uh, surgeons, as soon as they gain the trust, they also go uh, and touch the capsule and they feel comfortable, but it is always somehow a learning cor curve how they can trust uh, the IA instrument. But yes, uh, thank you for the trust and we will continue the video. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, sometimes there are some uh, small peripheral remnants uh, you can safely grasp uh, in the capsule polishing mode. Well, here, uh, cohesive OVD is being injected into the eye, filling uh, the capsular bag and the anterior chamber. And next, uh, one piece uh, hydrophobic acrylic lens is being implanted. I like to hold the eye with the chopper not uh, tilting it while introducing uh, the, the lens inserter. And here's the lens into the capsular bag. Uh, of course, uh, the OVD has to be removed and I'm quite fanatic about removing it completely as a number of uh, my patients also have glaucoma and I uh, really uh, like to do my best to avoid pressure spikes <clears throat> Sorry. So I go behind the lens uh, with uh, actually with both instruments. Uh, can you uh, run the video, yes. Alexandra? I have one intermediate question. Ah. And uh, of course, we are not selling any IULs, but anyway, I'm quite interested and maybe also our partners. Uh, are you working with uh, various? Uh, IULs manufacturer, or are, are you only focusing on one manufacturer? Well, the vast majority of the lenses are from the same manufacturer. Uh, we like that because we have the same platform. Uh, we don't need to change the calculations uh, if a toric lens has to be implanted or a multifocal. So yes, the most lenses are uh, from the same manufacturer. Well, incidentally, we use uh, different IOLs in uh, eyes which are far from standard. Okay, good. We continue. So, well, uh, the OVD needs to be removed from behind the lens. Uh, well, that's been done traditionally by the aspiration, but don't forget, you can also flush uh, the OVD away with the irrigation. And if, if you look carefully, you can see a little amount of OVD left uh, 
at the six o'clock. So I rotated the lens and I remove uh, the last bits. And next, uh, I try to position the lens with the optic haptic junction at the temporal side. Well, that should diminish the occurrence of uh, negative dysphotopsia. <clears throat> and uh, now the incisions uh, are being hydrated. Uh, I, I absolutely don't take any chances with uh, leaky, wound leakage or uh, possibility of, uh, well, something getting inside the eye from the outside. So I hydrate, take the time to hydrate the incisions and to always check in the end if the pressure, the eye pressure is uh, well normal or a bit higher than normal. Uh, I think. You can see that uh, after a moment, I check the eye pressure with the cannula. Yes, that last step. Okay. Now, uh, I know at the time of COVID, you now have introduced a new system, a new uh, working flow, new kind of administration, how to check the patients uh, after the operation on the following days. Uh, can you shortly describe how, how, uh, how that works, that uh, procedure? Uh, well, some years ago, uh, we used to see every patient uh, on the day after the surgery. Uh, nowadays, we don't do that. Uh, they uh, are being called by uh, one of our assistants and uh, a list of questions uh, is being asked uh, in order to, yeah, well, if uh, see if everything goes fine. If there are some uh, alarming, uh, well, answers to the questions, then we let the patients come uh, to the hospital. And of course, a part of the patients uh, are, have a checkup scheduled on day one if uh, that's a non-standard non operation or if something went uh, differently than expected. But the most patients are being called and uh, we spare them the visit to the hospital uh, in order to uh, well lower the risk of uh, contamination. 